you. Um, yes, that's pretty much my story. I, I grew up in Lafayette, uh, went to Florida, graduated with a fashion merchandising retailing degree, um, married a farmer in Kentland in a very small town, and there's not a whole lot you can do with a fashion degree in, in Kentland. So, so um, uh, anyway, my father is kind of how I got involved with Alice Ramsey. My father collected Maxwells, and Alice drove a Maxwell across the United States in 1909. So I'm going to tell you her story. Um, are there any questions before we get started, or get right into it? Okay. I like your outfit. Thank you. I, uh, I will tell you a little bit later on about my outfit, but this is kind of the period outfit from 1909. Okay. Did you drive a Maxwell here tonight? I did not drive a Maxwell here, no. But I have driven a Maxwell, so. Uh, okay. The Model T Ford was introduced in 1908. And before I really get started, can everybody hear me? Because we talked about if I needed a microphone or not. So if you can hear me, we're going to go without it. Okay? Thank you. The Model T Ford was introduced in 1908 to become the first most popular automobile of all time. But in 1909, only 155,000 Americans owned automobiles out of, out of a total population of 80 million. There were 290 automobile manufacturers, most employing only a few people. Continuing publicity was needed to convince the nation that the era of the horse had succumbed to the era of horse power. The Maxwell Briscoe Motor Company realized that a woman driving a Maxwell cross country over practically uncharted wilderness was a great advertising opportunity. Alice's trip wasn't a race. The purpose, as far as she was concerned, was to prove that a woman, a perfectly normal young mother, was capable of driving an automobile from coast to coast without the help of a man. But the Maxwell executives encouraged their dealers all along the route to guide Alice across America, and they did. Some pulled her out when she got stuck, she pulled some of them out when they got stuck. Alice was a highly skilled driver, which is why she was chosen to make the run in the first place, and not a bad mechanic either. This, Alice's book was called Veil, Duster, and Tire Iron. This was a republishing of Alice's book called Alice's Drive, and this is where I have received most of my information from. Alice Hewler Ramsey was born November 11, 1886, in Hackensack, New Jersey. She was married to John Rathbone Ramsey on January 10, 1906. Alice was 20 years old, and he was 43. He was an attorney, clerk of Bergen County, and later served two terms in the U.S. Congress. It was because of Bone, Alice's nickname for her husband, that Alice began driving. The story goes that Alice was out driving one of Bone's horses and carriage one day when the horse suddenly bolted upon hearing the honk from a new horseless carriage. After a wild ride, Alice was able to get the horse under control. But when her husband heard the story, he immediately ordered her a new horseless carriage and forbid her to ever use the horse and carriage again. Alice was born mechanical, showing a great curiosity about the working of any device, and even elected to take manual training of at Vassar College instead of some feminine art. So she was elated at the idea of an automobile and its mechanical functions. 
upon the very delivery of her new 1908 Maxwell Red Runabout, Alice proved to be a very adept driver and ticked off 6,000 miles of pleasure driving with her friends that first summer. Later that summer, Alice learned of the Montauk Point Reliability Run and was even more anxious to put her driving skills to the test. Only two women drivers were entered in the 150-mile endurance run. Alice won the bronze medal with a perfect score. It was because of her entry and the admirable handling of her car that brought about the idea of her transcontinental journey. At the end of the run, Mr. Carl Kelsey, sales manager of the Maxwell Briscoe Company in Terrytown, New York, arose from the dinner table and said, Mrs. Ramsey, I hope I have not caused you too much uneasiness today. I am sure I must have appeared to stare at you, for I have been thinking very deeply about the greatest promotional idea of my career. You know I've driven Maxwells up stairways and attracted so much attention to them that they are about the best known automobile in the world. But today, I've thought of something that puts all the rest in the shade. I've watched you drive all day and think you're the greatest natural woman driver I have yet seen. Now, you are going to be the first woman ever to drive an automobile across the United States of America, from Hell Gate on the Atlantic to the Golden Gate on the Pacific, and in a Maxwell. Alice thought he must be crazy, but after thinking about the proposal, was excited and eager about the idea. Upon approaching Bone with the idea, he agreed to the adventure as long as his two sisters would accompany her. The sisters, Nettie and Maggie, had accompanied her on many of her drives, including the Montauk Point Run. But they were well into their 40s, but just as interested and excited about the adventure. They were both well-groomed and dressed in the daintiest of French-heeled footwear, were conservative and reserved to the nth degree. Could such dressy and fastidious women manage with little in the way of fancy clothes for so long a period? And would they accept the provisions of a rugged jaunt across more or less uncharted country? What about food? Would they trust her decisions in regard to the automobile and its handling? And what about Alice's husband and young son, John? How long would this adventure take, and could she bear to be away from them that long? Shortly after, thereafter, Alice learned of another automobile reliability run for women drivers only, from New York to Philadelphia. Some newspapers derided the event as dangerous and ridiculous and beyond the capabilities of women drivers. This criticism, of course, merely whetted the appetites of those who were convinced that they could drive as well as most men. Each driver was allowed one passenger, a mechanican, and Alice had chosen her, as her companion, Hermione Johns, age 16. They had a wonderful two days of motoring fun with all their other fe feminine auto enthusiasts and carried off one of the trophies with a perfect score. It was only natural that this association would result in Armani being the logical fourth of the transcontinental trip. From that time on, their chief activity was preparing for the start of the trip, set for early June 1909. The Maxwell Briscoe Company generously furnished the automobile a Maxwell DA30 with a 30 horsepower engine and agreed to pay the actual expenses of the journey. Its officers also instructed their agents to keep on hand tires, gasoline, and spare parts 
in case of any breakdowns and ask that their representatives give Alice and her companions every possible attention. Most of them did just that, some of them even entertaining them in their homes. The company even furnished a picnic basket with a minimum of food rations and eating equipment and a camera which took photos of postcard size. A carrying rack was attached to the rear of the vehicle to hold the luggage. Each of them had one suitcase apiece. The suitcase contained, contained their city duds or dressy suits with pretty blouses, an extra pair of good looking shoes and the usual change of underwear and overnight necessities. Dresses were long and full in that era so this amount just about took up the case. Nettie and Maddie, Maggie both owned beautiful tra traveling luggage fitted with cut glass containers with silver tops for toilet articles. The luggage were wrapped each morning in a rubber cloth and removed each afternoon on arrival at their destination. For day-by-day -day wear, they had chosen suits of tan covert cloth as being most practical as far as the dust and light rain were concerned. With those, they wore simple blouses, dusters in warm and dry weather, and for rain, rubber ponchos and hats. Their fair weather hats were a type of large full cap with stiff visor to shield the eyes in the low western sun, over which crepe de chaine bills were draped and came into the, the draped and came under the chin to be tied in bellowing bows. Finally, June 9th was upon them. And as they arrived at their starting point at 1930 Broadway, New York, the Maxwell Company sales room, a considerable number, number of spectators were already assembled in the pouring rain. There stood friends, members of the Bra Maxwell Briscoe Company, newspapermen, and photographers. After several photos, interviews, and questions, Alice was anxious to get underway and finally said, I think we ought to get started. The men immediately cleared the way for them to mount their seats. Several willing hands reached for the crank handle at the front end of the automobile, but suddenly, recalling that this was to be a woman's expedition, Alice said, wait a minute, we had better get ourselves under, underway. Alice gave the crank a swing, a decisive upward pull, listened for the rewarding cough and roar, and then raced to the steering post to advance the gas and retard the spark. After a final photo and farewell, she let in the clutch. The wheels began to turn and they were off. The chains on the rear tires clanked with the first revolution of the wheels. Their first day's drive was very small by modern standards, but with the unimproved roads made so slippery by the storm, the 76 miles to Poughkeepsie and Alice's alma mater, Vassar College, were aplenty. The next morning it was still raining lightly and they continued with their chains and rain talks. From their north they were not so familiar with the country and Nettie opened up the blue book for directions to follow. Blue books were guides to certain sections of our states and were almost indispensable to motorists who ventured from home base. There were no free maps, MapQuest, or GPS back then. The dependable blue book with its accurate mileage from one town to another and detailed instructions where to turn or which fork in the road to choose was nearly as necessary as gasoline in the tank. The first volume was New York State, followed by New England. One by one, other sections were added. By 1909, they extended only to the Missouri River, leaving a vast void in the great wide west. 